so we talked about Helmholtz and all the major contributions he had. Uh, we talked about his contributions to vision and hearing and whatnot, as well as other things. But uh, the researchers that I'm going to mention going forward, uh, a lot of them had a reaction to Helmholtz or had um, a clarification point relative to what Helmholtz said. So if you remember, Helmholtz had this trichromatic theory of vision. Well, in response to that, Ewald Herring uh, has a different theory, right? So the opponent process theory of color vision suggests that we perceive in paired opposites, uh, such as an anabolic and a catabolic process. And anabolic process uh, refers to something that breaks down and the colors that were linked to, um, uh, pardon me, the catabolic process is to break down. Uh, colors linked to that are red, yellow, and white. And their paired opposites were the anabolic processes that build up. And red was paired with green, yellow was paired with blue, and white was paired with black. Uh, then we had another uh, discussion about space perception. Uh, he stated that we understand depth and whatnot, height, left, right, position, all of that stuff uh, due to our retina and the retina codes all of that stuff. So here is uh, what an after image looks like. So if you see uh, the uh, Superman image, uh, and after images, it flips it to the direct opposite color. Uh, and there is, there is research to support this model. So then we have uh, Christine Ladd Franklin and Christine Ladd Franklin talked about evolution and the role of evolution in most adaptive functioning. So when uh, Ladd Franklin talks about vision, she talks about it as, well, what was first to come and then what evolved later. So Christine Ladd Franklin talks about uh, peripheral vision uh, was more primitive than foveal vision. Um, and that's the peripheral vision is more for uh, black and white uh, perception, things of that nature and motion. Uh, and you'll see in neuroscience, the reason why peripheral uh, vision is such is because there's a disproportionate number of rods in uh, the periphery, whereas color vision and day vision and all the fine details, uh, they happen more in the fovea or the center of the eye, center of the retina, and they operate based on cone dominant processes. So there are more cones in uh, the, um, the retina. So, you, so basically we're talking about rods and cones, rods for black and white, uh, cones for color vision, and the location of each uh, or concentration of each, there's more cones in the retina and, or in, and in the fovea. Uh, and then there's more rods in the periphery. So we also have uh, black and white vision, achromatic vision, which is more primitive than color vision. And the argument is color vision evolved much later. So that's vision. These are the responses to Helmholtz in terms of vision. We also talked about audition or hearing. And it you may not remember, but when we talked about Helmholtz, we talked about the cochlea as kind of being wrapped up like strings or chords um, on, on a harp or a guitar um, and they're tight, right? And then depending on where uh, on the cochlea there is the vibration, you're gonna have a higher or lower frequency, right? So, uh, or a higher, lower decibel sound. 
so that's place theory where um, von Bekeshi, right? George von Bekeshi talks about um, a frequency theory and it suggests that there is a multiple places that are being activated and it's the composite vibration of various sounds that are responsible for the, for the actual height of the sound or the decibel level, the frequency. So uh, in terms of where this is happening, he talks about uh, the cranial nerve, the eighth cranial no nerve, uh, which we refer to as the vestibular cochlear nerve or the auditory nerve, however you want to. Um, and that's right, it, it does carry sound and language comprehension, but the problem with this um, frequency theory is that there is a refractory period of a neuron, meaning if a neuron fires uh, between action potentials, there's about a one millisecond lag. And because of that, you couldn't get the high frequencies based on this theory alone. So that's the criticism of von Bekeshi is that you just couldn't measure the whole um, length of uh, hearing. So ultimately, who's right? So we tend to say it's a combination of the two. When we're dealing with low frequencies, uh, the, the basilar membrane vibrates. And uh, when we're dealing with higher frequencies, uh, we operate based on more of a place theory model. So um, the same thing with vision, when we talk about the after images and all of that stuff, um, it wasn't that they were incorrect. It's just that uh, Helmholtz identified part of it and then people who responded identified additional parts to put it together. Uh, if you like this discussion, I strongly recommend a class in neuroscience. 232 is a very good one. And you'll learn all about the senses and how they operate both in the sense organ as well as the perceptual understanding that happens in the brain. So today we combine the two. So now we want to talk about Weber, Ernst Weber. He was born in Wittenberg, Germany, got his PhD in Leipzig, and ultimately taught anatomy and physiology. So his interests were more about sensation and perception or the physiology of the sense organs. And ultimately, he dabbled into other sensations other than just vision and hearing. So when he, when he focused more on the cutaneous or skin-based or touch-based sense or the muscular sensations, right? These were, these were other senses that were uh, lesser studied. So that's a good thing because if you look at it, uh, Helmholtz put more of an emphasis on vision and hearing. So you'll probably hear uh, the term, you might have heard this in a biology book already, uh, the two-point threshold. And the two-point threshold is basically the, the point by which you could identify two uh, points of stimulation at the same time and know that it's two. So if you took a basic biology course, they would uh, probably teach you this with the protractor in the skin, and they would start very close where you would perceive it as one, even though there are two points or two needles, you would perceive it as um, one point. But as it gets further and further apart, you can detect the, um, that there are two points or two, two needles pointing on the skin. Uh, now the two point threshold for the skin is, like I said, the distance by which we can detect these uh, two uh, stimuli, uh, the compass, uh, like apparatus, not the protractor, forgive me about that. Um, the, the compass is the one that we use for two point threshold. And, um, he was the first person to demonstrate this two point threshold. 
and uh, come to the conclusion, uh, the more receptors there are in a given area, the finer the discrimination. And, I, and this is true. When you think about it, if we go back to our discussion from Wilder Penfield, Wilder Penfield talked about the somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex, right? And the way he drew the uh, face and the hands was disproportionately larger or more surface area than uh, the small of the back, right? So it's interesting because the, the more neurons are in the brain, the, the smaller the uh, two-point threshold is gonna be. So if we were to say, well, what is the smallest? The smallest two-point threshold discovered is on the tongue, and the largest distance that, that needs to be is on the middle of the back. So if you look at this, I took this picture out of the neuroscience book, but if you look at it and the height of the peak and, and um, how far apart they need to be, you'll see that uh, on the back, it has a very high one on the calf, it has a very high one, but when you get to things like the fingers, which we use to explore our environment, uh, things like the face or aspects of the face, they're much smaller. And the, the principle is that the more neurons you have in an area, uh, the finer the detection will be, but the more neurons you have in an area, it's more likely that that's there to promote survival on an evolutionary level. So uh, there's a combination between the two. Now, so when we talk about kinesthesis and the just noticeable difference, uh, kinesthesis are sensations caused by muscular activities. So when you, I'll give you an example, when you run on a treadmill, the planting of one foot and then the next, that is going to cause uh, kinesthesis, right? It's going to cause a sensation um, in the muscles. And the just noticeable difference is the smallest difference that could be detected between two stimuli. So if we're talking about, uh, you know, muscles and weight discrimination, if I held up two things, one in one hand, one in the other, um, we would need roughly uh, one fortieth uh, of a difference in order to detect uh, that there is a different weight. So if it's less than one out, one out of 40 um, or two and a half percent difference, we're not going to detect that. So that's the threshold for our uh, when weights are lifted. Now, when they're placed in our hands versus lifting, we actually have less ability to detect, right? So we need one out of 30. And when you think about the math on that, that's a 3.33% uh, difference versus uh, the 2.5% difference when lifting a weight. So Weight discrimination, lifting it, we're able to, to detect it a lot easier than if it's placed in our hand. Now, um, Weber's law uh, was understanding the difference in terms of a constant ratio for each sense. So each sense organ would have its own ratio, but it is a constant. Now, in terms of the just noticeable difference, perception of a stimulus is not directly connected or related to the physical stimulus. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. So the just noticeable difference is how our brain understands this difference or uh, the stimulus sensation relationship. So that's really what the just noticeable difference is. So you could already see when we talked about psychophysics, we're trying to understand the relationship between the mind and perception and the body, right? So the perceptual experience in the body. So 
here's Weber's fractions. Again, uh, like I said, Weber says the just noticeable difference is a constant, but it is different across each sensory dimension. So uh, one hundredth of uh, one out of a hundred difference will detect if it's coming to electrical shock. When it comes to weights, it's really 0 0.025, but they lopped it off at 0 0.02. Uh, then when it comes to sound intensity is 0 0.04, light intensity is 0 0.08. So um, 0 0.08 would be um, two out of every 25 or one out of every 12 and change, and then taste the same thing. So it's really interesting how our brain perceives these sensory experiences. So that's Weber. Now, Gustav Fechner. Fechner is a, another major player in our field. Uh, remember this name, because when we talk about Sigmund Freud, uh, we're going to mention Freud had this analogy that the mind is like an iceberg, right? where very little is up above the water and the vast majority of the iceberg is under the water. And he drew that connection to the unconscious. So Freud said, uh, the mind, the largest portion is the id, which happens beneath the surface in the unconscious. But the analogy itself was not Freud's. It actually came from Gustav Fechner. Fechner, uh, use this analogy well before Freud, and Freud borrowed it for his theory. Um, so now Fechner, similar to Helmholtz, was uh, quite intelligent, and he, um, he was interested in a whole bunch of things, physiology, uh, physics, and psychophysics, uh, then philosophy. So he contributed to so many disciplines, um, and yet he had a breakdown, right? With all of this, he had a breakdown and uh, became an invalid or incapable of functioning for roughly 12 years of his life. Um, but even though he contributed to so many different disciplines, his greatest fame and why we're talking about him is his understanding of psychophysics. So uh, who was he? He was born in uh, Southeastern Germany, went to medical school in Leipzig, uh, Germany, and ultimately attended Weber's lectures on physiology. And that's what inspired, um, inspired his interest in physiology. And it's interesting that you know, he struggled, like he, he had a dualistic mind, he had con conflict. So he had a pseudonym or a pen name called Dr. Mises, where he would write satires and criticisms on medicine and science. So even though he was a scientist, he used this uh, pseudonym uh, to offer criticism. He also had, uh, like I said, this duality in his personality where part of him, he was a scientist, but part of him wanted to understand metaphysics, which is outside the realm of, um, of quantifiability. So metaphysics that uh, things like the soul and things like uh, uh, the connection between the spirit and the universe all of these things um, are hard to measure. So he struggled with um, many aspects and he referred to it as a day view in a night view. So the day view regarded the universe from a uh, view of consciousness, whereas the night view, the universe and consciousness only consisted of uh, inner matter. So you have the, again, I'm trying to show you his polarity. Um, now, he shifts away from medicine 
uh, and then starts studying physics and mathematics uh, and starts teaching. In 1824, he becomes a lecturer and does research at Leipzig, Germany. And by 1830, he pretty much was uh, one of the leading people in the field. And he was translating everything and anything in terms of chemistry and physics. So uh, if you took a physics class, you would hear uh, Fechner's name. If you took a chemistry class, you would hear Fechner's name. If you took a philosophy class, you would hear um, Fechner's name. 1833, he becomes uh, a professor, appointed professor, not just a lecturer. Uh, people don't realize that there are different status symbols in academia. So there's clearly the difference between an adjunct professor and a full-timer, but there are also levels. So if you hear assistant professor, associate professor, and then just professor, professor is the highest one. Um, or actually, technically, there's distinguished professor as well. But um, he was appointed professor, like that's one of the greatest honors. But then he became depressed and all of a sudden he became bedridden and uh, couldn't sleep, didn't eat, um, became photophobic. So he just uh, was a recluse. He stayed in his home, uh, really um, trying to just hold on. And um, people, you know, people tried helping him his mom tried helping him by reading to him. Um, he tried a, a whole host of, um, you know, bizarre cures. And keep in mind at that time, there were these statements that, um, you know, people would travel from community to community saying, I have the cure for this, I have the uh, um, cure for that. Uh, many of them were fake, right? So uh, none of these cures worked. Um, Allegedly, he recovered for a brief moment uh, by eating ham, and um, then he started uh, dr dreaming about his recovery. And um, you know, he was uh, dream dreamt that he was cured or going to be cured in seventy-seven days, and ultimately that happened. So, um, you know, it's a sad story because he was so great and contributed in so many ways, but. Uh, his mind uh, did not hold up. He started to develop uh, psychotic features such as hallucinations and uh, delusions, right? Delusions of grandeur. Uh, and, you know, these psychotic states are not going to be useful in academia. So ultimately, they decided to pension him out. Uh, and said, you know, uh, thank you for your service. Um, we'll give you your pension, but, you know, we can't have you teaching. Uh, but aside from that, you know, he did talk about things, like I said, that Freud discovered, like the pleasure principle, right? We all want pleasure. We all seek pleasure. Um, he discovered a lot of things that later other people would borrow. So what is the mind-body relationship? Well, we talked about this uh, in philosophy, right? Descartes, right? So um, the concept of dualism. But he had an insight that uh, about the mind-body relationship that it should be able to be uh, quantified, whereas um, Descartes, it was more of this philosophical explanation, uh, Fechner ultimately attempted to quantify uh, the sensation uh, uh, and perceptual experience. Uh, so it, that, that's moving us towards science as well, which is great. And what he determined was that the sensation or the sensory input does not have a one-to-one -one relationship with mental uh, processes or perception. It doesn't, right? And he, he demonstrated this by saying, hey, uh, if we were to add some of the same thing to that which is going on, 
how much would it detect it? So if I add uh, a bell to one other, we're gonna perceive that second bell more than the first bell versus uh, if there are 10 other bells and we're adding one bell. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. It kind of gets absorbed in uh, as there are more other uh, bells. Same thing when we talk about singing. Uh, we noticed that there were a lot of um, bands and groups that were of like four people or five people and they would harmonize. Look at Boys to Men, for example. Um, they harmonize very well, but you could detect each of their voices. Whereas if you were to put them into a larger choir, you wouldn't be able to detect all of their voices the same way. So ultimately, this is pretty cool that he was able to quantify the relationship between the mind and the body. And he was able to demonstrate that it's not uh, a one-to-one -one ratio, it's more logarithmic, if anything. So he comes up with his own term. Now we've talked about the just noticeable difference, but he talked about the absolute threshold. And the absolute threshold was the point by which we are gonna have a sensory experience or not. So if we hit that threshold, we're gonna perceive an experience. Um, if it's below that, we're not going to perceive that sensation. Now, the word threshold in German is Lyman. So if you ever hear the term subliminal, right, subliminal messages, they're undetectable. Well, how does it happen that a person can uh, interject subliminal messages? Well, they, they uh, present the stimulus so fast that you cannot perceive it but it, your brain processes it later. So that's the, the interesting thing about the threshold is that, yeah, you could theoretically have um, an experience that's subliminal, which he used the term negative sensations or sensations that are below the threshold. So he acknowledged they exist, we just can't detect them. Uh, another example is if you've ever, um, use the dog whistle. We cannot hear the sound of a dog whistle, can we? Right, because we're not sensitive to that frequency of sound, whereas uh, dogs can. So that's what we mean as that absolute threshold. Is it in our window by which we can detect that sensation? If it's below it, we're not gonna detect it. Doesn't mean it's not there, we just can't detect it. So we can uh, talk about the absolute threshold. Um, we could also talk about the differential threshold, which is the point of sensitivity uh, at which we're able to detect a change in the stimulus uh, or rise uh, to the change in stimulus. So we're able to detect just noticeable differences. That's the differential threshold according to Fechner, right? Uh, and then in terms of um, just noticeable differences you have, that's used as some kind of measurement for the magnitude or the peak of that stimulus. So that's uh, the differential threshold. Now, Ve uh, Weber, we talked about Fechner's law is S equals K log R. Now each character means something. S means the, the perceptual experience of the sensation is a constant relative uh, to a logarithmic relationship or the of the magnitude of the stimulus. A lot of words doesn't mean much except for the fact that um, we're saying ultimately the how we perceive uh, a stimulus, it, um, it is consistently logarithmic to the intensity of that stimulus. That's all it is. So as we raise a stimulus or the intensity for that difference to occur or to detect it, 
it has to raise with it. So now we talk about psychophysics, right? Measuring or the scientific study of the relationship between the mind and the body. So we could use the method of adjustment, constant stimuli, and the method of limits. So let's go through each of them. The method of adjustment is basically accounting for individual differences. If you remember Bessel, we talked about Bessel trying to understand how people had you know, different scores when studying astronomy. And he discovered that there are individual differences. So what does the method of adjustment do? The method of adjustment, according to Fechner, just calculates uh, those errors, the individual differences. So ultimately, if you want to describe it, it's your average error. So we take a whole bunch of trials uh, and present stimuli after stimuli. We could get an average uh, reaction time, or we could get an average difference score. Uh, and that average difference score is considered uh, your error in observation. So another way of quantifying these individual differences and removing any kind of error there is in the data. So ultimately he used reaction time. He used it to measure reaction time on both visual and auditory discriminations. And again, method of adjustment, just think average error. You're calculating the average error in the data set. So um, the method of constant stimuli, so you use two, uh, two constant stimuli, you have a standard stimulus and a comparison. And ultimately the goal is to be able to uh, be able to determine whether that second stimulus is greater than, less than, or equal to the first stimulus. And that could be a visual color, it could be a, a sound, it could be weights, as we talked about earlier in the lesson. But the using two constant stimuli, it's basically you have one and a, a comparison uh, stimulus. Now, he also talked about the method of limits, which is your threshold or the differential threshold. You have two stimuli presented uh, and ultimately we're either increasing or decreasing um, the difference between the two to, to quantify, well, where did you detect that difference? And where do you no longer detect that difference? So we're able to identify that threshold that he talked about. And of course, because they're scientists, they use many trials over and over and over, and they average them so that uh, they don't get um, error in the data set, right? So uh, that's the method of limits. Uh, you may recall that Fechner uh, struggled. He struggled psychologically, but he still produced, even you know, as he, you know, was in an impaired psychological state. He wrote the Elements of Psychophysics, uh, which was basically the connection between the mind and the body, or the relationship between the physical and psychological worlds. So the way he understood how can we quantify mental processes? How can we study psychological processes? How can we study the soul? The only way to do it is introspection. So we turn inward and observe our internal experience. Whereas physical, the physical world or the body or the like in the material world, you study through ex uh, external observation. So it's interesting that when it came to the physical world, he adopted the same principles uh, as the British empiricists did. But when it came to mentalistic processes, he felt that it was hard to use uh, empiricism. We had to use a different method. Now he did believe that the relationship between the mind and the body were lawful. So they were predictable. Uh, consistent. 
Uh, so there were very few outliers. And um, he decided, let's start with the physical world because it's quantifiable, it's measurable through external observation, right? So there's no subjectivity. Um, and he also said that the psychological depends on the physical or the mental depends on the physical, which is true when we think about cognition. If I were to ask you for a good definition of intelligence, what would it be? Does anyone have a working definition of intelligence? Feel free to raise your hand virtually. Uh, Victoria. Um, I guess it would be judged by your comprehension skills and okay. um, I guess just like identifying and analyzing like your ability, how well you're able to do that with certain things. So comprehension is only part of it, right? Anyone have another um, definition that might be broader than comprehension? Jonathan. Is it how fast you can answer a question? So processing speed is part of it. Uh, I think Ms. Memetaj raised her hand too, yeah. I was just gonna say the ability to apply knowledge. Beautiful. The ability to apply knowledge. That is broad. It is accurate though. Now, here's the problem. How do we know how you apply knowledge? The ability to profit from experience. How do we know? Let's see what's in the chat. So the ability to deal and understand with a new situation. That's another spin on it. So your ability to profit from experience or you know, integrate knowledge. How do we know how well you do? Well, the answer is we give you an intelligence test. So even though we're, we're measuring a cognitive process such as intelligence, you know, we're tapping into or we're inferring from your physical behavior, directly observable behavior. So cognitive states typically depend on behavioral outputs or the physical world. Now, there are different parts of an intelligence test and this is why I kind of didn't um, leave it as just comprehension. So there, if we were to take the Wexler test, for example, just one of the subtypes, uh, there's the verbal comprehension index, right? And that measures comprehension. So we might ask you uh, what some words mean. We might ask you some practical uh, decision-making things, like if you find a wallet on the street, what should you do with it? Not what would you do with it, right? So judgment, decision-making kind of things, you should return it. You should put it in a mailbox. You should drop it off at the police station. These are all the right answer. Uh, doesn't mean if you're struggling that you won't see if there's any money in it, right? There are people that do that all the time. But it, that is the comprehension piece, right? Uh, but that's not all intelligence is, because if that's the case, then if you had a nonverbal person, they wouldn't be able to display intelligence, would they? Um, so that, that it can't just be um, our expression of like verbal comprehension or things like that. So there is, as Jonathan said, processing speed, right? The ability to accurately uh, complete a task in an efficient way. Processing speed's part of it. Memory, right? So um, how good your working memory is and so forth. I'm just giving you sub uh, components of the Wexler intelligence test. But whether I'm talking about your verbal comprehension you either have to say or do something, whether I'm talking about your processing speed, uh, you have to say or do something, whether I'm talking about your working memory, you have to say or do something, right? Whether it be verbal or nonverbal activity. So regardless, even though we're, we're 
talking about a mental element or a mental component like intelligence still depends on the physical world. So we're still, as uh, clinicians who do assessment, we still depend on performance on a test. So here's probably the most accurate and least vague definition of intelligence. A person's intelligence is how well they perform on an intelligence test. Full stop. Not ambiguous, not vague. Like the best definition we had was vague, your ability to profit from experience. But that's not meaningful. You can't measure that. Like in, it, in those words, we have to boil it down to some kind of physical behavior. Does this make sense? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, good. Because I think this point is, is important when we get to applied psychology and the testing movement, we, we struggled with this and trying to understand how to measure the mind. But um, in this regard, uh, Fechner was ahead of his time, right? Um, we're going to learn all about Galton, which was Darwin's cousin, and his view on how to measure intelligence, which was completely bogus. It didn't work. And then we'll learn about Alfred Binet, who actually did measure intelligence properly. So, but if they were a, a student of Fechner, they would have had a leg up on everyone, understanding that the measurement of mental components is always dependent on the physical because we could directly observe what you say, what you do. All right, so what did um, Fechner contribute to the field? Well, uh, he pushed back against Immanuel Kant, which I love Immanuel Kant's philosophy, but Immanuel Kant felt that psychology could not be a science because the psychological processes that we talk about could not be measured. Whereas Fechner said, no, you measure the mental process or the psychological process through a behavioral test, through a self-report test, things like that. We could tap into the psyche. Um, so he also provided, Fechner that is, provided the prerequisites for the science of psychology, making it possible to, to measure any mental process. He also inspired Wilhelm Wundt, right? Wundt is the father of experimental psychology. He does all these sensation and perception studies, but really, he, it didn't happen in a vacuum. When we think about it, you had Weber and Fechner and all of these physiologists who are doing uh, experimental physiology. What Wundt did was flipped it to make it experimental psychology, quantifying, measuring the mind. So he gave us also techniques, right, to, to measure the mind, the absolute threshold, the just noticeable differences, things like that, to be able to increase precision uh, is important. So if we look at the formal foundation of psychology as a science, uh, you could see, uh, and we're going to talk about this next class, but you could see uh, Wundt and how he profited from the natural sciences and how the natural sciences were used to study mental phenomena, physiology and so forth, or psychophysics, which is most germane. We also see the importance of the senses and observation that the British empiricists and astronomers use, right? Uh, we see the German physiologists who are able to understand um, the sense organs, right? So when we talk about the various methods, right? 
uh, the clinical method, the extirp uh, extirpation method and so forth. These are all methodology to tap into what's going on in the brain. And the fusion of philosophy and physiology was already happening. It was already happening with Fechner. So all we needed was Wundt, who put the finishing touch or the final touch on it and put all of this and brought it all together. And that, my friends, and this is the reason why it's a good place to stop for our first exam, is the precursors to psychology. So now you add a flavor of the general history, the philosophy and the physiology, and how we talked about the zeitgeist, the socio-political um, spirit of the times, that energy was pushing us towards a psychological science. And Funt capitalized, and you're gonna hear all about that next class. But that is our, our lesson. Uh, and that's a good place for us to stop. Now, 